Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore. I'm thrilled today to be partnering with our friends at NYRB, New York Review Books, and Congregation Beth Elohim once again to welcome Omri Bohm for the release of Haifa Republic, A Democratic Future for Israel, in conversation with Susie Linfield. While we're eagerly awaiting the return of in-person events, virtual ones like the one that you're about to see this evening continue to be a joy. And so I wanna give a very special thank you to our guests for joining us tonight and to all of you at home for tuning in. Now to some housekeeping. You should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit those. Uh, we'll be asking them at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat button through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book, which is of course very important. And one caveat for tonight's event is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please do bear with any technical issues that might arise and we'll try to solve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we've scheduled a whole host of summer programming for you at Community. So do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Thursday, September 2nd, we're thrilled to welcome Merve Emre for a discussion of her new edition, uh, The Annotated Mrs. Dalloway, in conversation with Adam Dalva. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. And finally, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. Now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Omri Bohm is a professor of philosophy at the New School for Social Research. He's the author of The Binding of Isaac, A Religious Model of Disobedience, and Kant's Critique of Spinoza. His writings on Israeli politics and culture have appeared in Haaretz, Die Zeit, The New York Times, and elsewhere. Susie Linfield is the author of The Cruel Radiance, Photography and Political Violence. She teaches journalism at, the New at New York University, where she directs the cultural reporting and criticism program. So without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you two, Omri and Susie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much. Well, um, um, thank you. And thank you, um, Susie, for doing uh, this event um, uh, with me and with us on such a uh, short notice. Um, we spoke earlier today, and we sort of had it figured out about how to go about um, the setting. But um, And we decided that I will speak for 10, 15 minutes, just introduce briefly the book, then you will speak and I suppose um, I raise some challenges uh, because we do not necessarily agree about absolutely everything. Um, and then maybe depending on uh, the criticisms that you will be uh, raising, um, I might um, try to respond again if we have time before we open this to Q&A and then uh, we'll have enough time for uh, Q&A. Let me, um, perhaps even before I describe the book, um, let me say why I'm so especially delighted, and I do not just say that, um, uh, for the opportunity or about the opportunity to speak to you about uh, my book, about Haifa Republic. The reason is that I think that we agree on just enough um, um, in order to make our many disagreements meaningful and interesting. And for me, this has been one of the reasons why um, um, the conversations with you have been always especially challenging. I know already all the people that I agree with about too many things. Um, I know the people I deeply disagree with on too many things. With you, I always uh, find um, the real challenge of articulating and re-articulating my position because we actually agree and disagree. And I want to say a word about what it is that I think that we actually agree about. Um, uh, before I move to a word about the disagreements, which already will uh, get us into the book. Um, um, I think the agreement uh, that I have with your position, which you also articulated so well in your own book, uh, uh, The Lion's Den, I think the agreement is on the claim that all too often, leftist criticisms of Israel are deeply ideological, um, and in that sense, um, especially those who promote one state politics and harsh criticisms of Zionism, if not flatly anti-Zionist criticisms of Israel, um, those perspectives are often just formulated uh, from an anti-Israeli perspective that is not open to the reality on the ground. Um, and um, for me, this criticism is especially important because as you know, as, as um, it will become very clear in a moment, 
Um, my position is one that on the level of content is actually very similar and often in uh, clear agreement with a lot of uh, what people sometimes call, correctly or not, uh, we will discuss, uh, anti-Zionist, uh, not to say anti-Israeli, I'm definitely not anti-Israeli uh, in any way, but on um, many of the contents of this debate, I actually agree with those who are not Zionists. And for that reason, often I find it important to articulate my position such that it would not be merely ideological, that it would actually respond to what I take to be importantly the facts on the ground or reality as I think we need to notice it or to note it. Um, um, and not just that, also that um, we ought to do this in a perspective that's still in solidarity with Israel, because I think we ought to be, um, despite harsh criticism, um, we have to be also in um, solidarity with Israel. Um, so here is a, the, um, on the level of content, here are the propositions that I think probably I would fit um, more the um, so-called anti-Israeli post or anti-Zionist side, right? I do not think that a Jewish state can be a liberal democracy. And I argue for this fiercely in the book. I will say another word about this in a moment. Um, I do not think that for that reason, the two state solution is uh, um, a possible or even a desirable solution. I do not think that um, the occupation is some accident that happened to the state of Israel in 67 and that we have to fix in order to backpedal to just Zionism or to salvage liberal Zionism or salvage the notion of a Jewish democracy. I think the problems run much, much um, deeper. Another issue is that I think that the memory of the Nakba is uh, crucial to um, going forward with Israeli politics. So um, um, the political expression of this would be a certain relation to the right of return. And for that reason, I support positions that are uh, one state um, positions. All too often, those positions are articulated by people who are anti-Israeli, um, uh, anti-Zionist, what I tried to do in Haifa Republic, and this is really the main um, uh, novelty of the book, because I think that a lot of the propositions that I'm making um, uh, have been heard before. I'm trying to articulate them for people who consider themselves pro-Israel, who want a future for Israel, who want um, a future of living well in Israel. I, and I try to show that there are ways of speaking this language such that it's um, consistent with um, even Zionist ambitions, not as we've come to know them, that is not as um, uh, formulated, formulated with the notion of the Jewish state, but rather the Zionist ambition of securing Jewish self-determination, the national rights of Jews, um, which need not go through um, the notion of Jewish sovereignty or more specifically, the notion of a Jewish state. So that's basically um, uh, the project of this uh, little book to articulate um, the way to think about even Zionist politics in a post two state era um, and given the harsh and I think just opposition to the ethnic liberalism or sorry to the ethnic nationalism, not liberalism, the ethnic nationalism that we find in Israel not just with Benjamin Netanyahu or Naftali Bennett or Yair Lapid, but even with figures, as I argue in the book, such as uh, David Grossman, Amos Oz, because I think their positions are in the end, not genuinely democratic, not genuinely uh, liberal, and they come under um, harsh attack. The first, so the book has four chapters. I can uh, run through them very fast and then uh, um, um, we'll listen to your um, commentary. The first chapter um, argues, has basically two arguments. One is that a Jewish state cannot be a liberal democracy, right? So that um, a Jewish, the a Jewish and democratic slogan is basically a contradiction in terms, has always been. The reason is that um, in a democracy, the people asserts its sovereignty and in a Jewish state, the people are the Jewish people. So um, non-Jews do not belong to uh, the sovereign people. Um, um, often liberal Zionists like to argue if, um, uh, for example, that if 
a state like Sweden, you know, if you can have a Swedish and democratic state, why can you not have a Jewish and democratic state? The answer is that I think that question has always been a lie and this is high time uh, to realize this. Uh, the reason is that um, Israel is not an Israeli state. Sweden is a Swedish state. Israel is not an Israeli state, it's a Jewish state. And whereas it is possible to be uh, a Jewish or a Muslim or a Christian Swede, it is impossible to be a Muslim or a Christian Jew. But the people of the state of Israel are um, the Jewish people. That's just a fast way of articulating, I think, the essence of the Jewish and, Demo um, the Jewish and democratic contradiction. The chapter ends by asking, does it mean that in order to salvage liberal Zionism, we need to abandon Zionism? And the answer that I give in the book is yes and no. If the notion of a Jewish state um, is the essence of Zionism, then we have to abandon Zionism, I think. And it's important for me to uh, say this clearly, also because people have already started um, uh, reviewing the book. I'm presented as someone who's out to uh, defend Zionism. This is partly true, partly not. The main issue is not just defending Zionism. To say if Zionism is a notion of, um, um, uh, depends on the notion of a Jewish state, then um, I'm not a Zionist. But I try to show, um, uh, drawing also on the work of others, that the history of Zionism knows um, a consensus, in fact. In um, earlier times, a consensus about the notion of binational uh, Zionism, we're not Jewish sovereignty, we're not the Jewish state, uh, but rather Jewish self-determination in a binational state is a driving um, uh, essence of uh, Zionist politics. And um, this is something that you can find not just in the far-fetched Brit Shalom, some people know about that, but um, rather you find this in ways in Herzl even, uh, one can discuss this. You find this in Chad Ha'am, that's uh, not controversial, but you would find this even in Ben Gurion, Jabotinsky, um, and so forth. And um, um, rereading those paragraphs in the beginning of Zionism is something that's important for me because I want to show a binational state where um, self-determination rather than sovereignty is the essence of Zionism is not anti-Zionist. It can also be seen as Zionist politics. Um, what caused, if there was a, such a consensus about binationalism bi as a, a fully Zionist politics, the, question, the next question is, what caused this consensus to disappear and almost be forgotten? And the answer is, I think, twofold. It is the Holocaust and the Nakba. Uh, on the one hand, the systematic extermination of European Jewry gave the Jewish people um, very good reasons to wish to have their own sovereignty, uh, to decide about their own borders, to have their own military, uh, and so forth, and so forth. The other um, event or the other um, transition was, I think, the Peel Commission, which in 36, 37, introduced very practically um, the possibility of population transfers and really ethnic cleansing, which um, allowed the Jews to see the Jewish leadership. People like Ben Gurion are, um, um, you can really see a transition in their thinking in, at that moment, uh, that they think we, they can actually expel the Palestinians and for that reason have, they do not need a binational state. Um, they can go with a Jewish state. I think that that together with uh, the pressures coming um, from Germany and Europe um, created the notion that Zionism is essentially tied to um, um, a Jewish state. So uh, one thing that I think that we need to do in order to move forward in Israel in a post two state era is to uh, go back to the past, right? to um, uh, go back in time and just revive the notion um, of binational Zionism. Of course, this cannot be done. I deliberately put it in this crude way because I do not think it can be done. Um, I don't think we can pretend that it can be done. But it, here is what I think can be done in order to revive binationalism in our thinking. We can develop a politics of memory. Israel knows a very muscular politics of memory. We can develop a politics of memory that's not just about remembering the Holocaust, but about uh, what I call in the book, and of course I'm not the first one, um, um, 
a politics of remembering to forget, remembering to forget both the Holocaust and the Nakba. Those are chapters two and three. Chapter two is about the Holocaust. Chapter um, three is about the Nakba. Um, uh, they develop a criticism of the tendency in Israel to fetishize the memory of the Holocaust and to make it national and therefore a threat to democracy rather than public. That is something that citizens have to participate as such. Um, I try to show that even Arab or Palestinian Israelis can participate in the practices of Israeli memory, including of the Holocaust as a patriotic duty. Coming out of that, um, the memory of the Nakba, which has been um, repressed and censored in Israel in uh, very powerful ways. I think that uh, we need to learn to bring that out. The idea is constantly to play on the um, uh, dialogue between remembering and forgetting. What you remember, what we remember together as citizens, we can also forget, we can put aside and move on. I think that um, um, this type of politics is possible in Israel and I think it's far-fetched, but it's possible. And um, I want to recommend it as a way not to go back to the past, but as a way to reconceive um, or to rethink um, binational Zionism. The book ends with uh, the last fourth chapter, Haifa Republic, which try, tries to revive another um, all too often forgotten plan um, or a political moment in our past, and that is the begging plan of 1977-1978. Um, Israelis and some experts of uh, Israeli history and politics um, sometimes remember Begin, um, Begin's autonomy plan, this is how they call it, um, of 77. But I think that the name is extremely misleading. We need to look much more carefully at the Begin plan because what gets called the autonomy plan, we need to notice, could actually be called the one state. Plan. Begin, Israel's um, first prime, uh, first right-wing prime minister, of course, was a fierce opponent of any territorial compromise uh, with the Palestinians. When Ben Gurion in uh, 47 accepted the partition resolution, he rejected it. But when Jimmy Carter and Anwar Sadat um, um, suggested or demanded that Begin offers that Begin would offer something to the Palestinians as part of the peace agreement with Egypt, Begin got back to them with, a, with an interesting and surprising plan. It was called the autonomy plan, but again, it was much more than a mere autonomy. What Begin suggested was to offer all Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza full Israeli citizenship, so to have a Palestinian autonomy, this is why it's called a Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank and in Gaza, but to also offer all Palestinians full Israeli citizenship. So those Palestinians will be able to elect and get elected to uh, parliament. Um, they will also have full freedom of movement on the whole territory, full economic rights on the whole territory um, and so forth and so forth, and the Jews would have to be sure the same. So Jews would be allowed to move freely and to um, settle, uh, uh, to buy land, to walk on the full territory, also in the West Bank and Gaza. This fact, this, um, um, the, fa the idea that an Israeli prime minister could offer all Palestinians full Israeli citizenship is I think um, an extremely important uh, fact about our past that we need to reconsider today. I don't think we need to just return to Begin's Begin plan because it was obviously um, one that still preserved the notion of a Jewish democracy, which I reject. But I think that it can show us that there are ways to go beyond uh, the existing taboos about uh, what from within Jewish sovereignty is and is not possible. And the reason is the following, and with this I can maybe end and we'll uh, then talk more. While it is true that offering all Palestinians citizens citizenship in a Jewish state does not give them 
full equality, because as I argue in the book, and as I mentioned here, a Jewish state cannot be fully democratic. That's usually precisely the reason why the Jewish state does not offer um, Palestinians full citizenship. The idea is we cannot offer Palestinians full citizenship because that contradicts Jewish sovereignty. I think that by offering all Palestinians full citizenship, Begin was actually stretching the notion of Jewish sovereignty beyond its recognized, um, beyond its recognized um, um, limits. Um, I want to use this in the book in order to suggest um, the type of politics that we need to rethink today in order to create um, a more just, uh, actually binational uh, constellation rather than just um, a constellation in which you have a Jewish state that accommodates a Palestinian autonomy. With this, I can uh, maybe finish. I'll uh, hear you and then uh, we can move on. Okay. Uh, so first off, thank you for inviting me uh, to this. I actually feel honored that Omri has asked me um, to participate with him. I just wanted to make a couple of clarifications to Noah's introduction. I am a professor at NYU, but I do not direct the cultural program anymore, a colleague does. And my last book, which Omri mentioned, is The Lion's Den, which is a book about Zionism and the left. Which, and it's really that book that started Omri and I uh, speaking about these various topics. Uh, I want to start out by saying that, frankly, any solution that Palestinians and Israelis would agree to is fine with me. Um, far be it from me, the diaspora Jew who can't even speak Hebrew, to dictate what a solution uh, should be. So I, I just wanna start by saying that whether Omri's hyper-republic is a realistic solution and would be that solution is a different question. Uh, but I wanted to uh, uh, bring up a, a few things first. Uh, first is uh, the view of uh, history that Omri puts forth in his book. And as he just said, he believes in going back to what he says a certain binational origins or a certain binational tendency in Zionism. Um, and and uh, you write the main reason that, that uh, binationalism was abandoned was the Holocaust. So I wanna say a few things about that since I think we both really care a lot about history. So first, of course, as you would agree, the Holocaust changed things. It's a pretty big event. Um, any movement that doesn't respond to e actual events is not, is not a political movement. It's just, it's just a uh, paralyzed ideology. So of course the Holocaust changed things. But I would say that this is actually a very partial and in fact a sort of Judeo-centered explanation of the abandonment of binationalism um, and even sort of an undialectical one, although I fear saying that to a philosopher. I would say that equally important uh, is that there was no tendency within the Arab national movement for binationalism. As Benny Morris has written, the Zionist binationalists were regarded with loathing and contempt by the Arab and political and Palestinian intellectuals and organizations. There was nothing by about binationalism. It was a solely Jewish tendency. It was, it was solely a Jewish Zionist tendency. Uh, there are so many uh, examples of this. I'll just say, you know, at the 1939 conference in London about the future of Palestine, the Arab, they were called Arabs then, and most of them were actually from outside uh, Palestine, I think. The Arab delegation refused to even sit in the same room with, with, uh, with Jews, with Zionists. Uh, in the, uh, uh, Gershom Sholem's famous debate with Hannah Arendt, uh, Sholem makes this clear. Uh, he talks about why he abandoned binationalism. He never mentions the Holocaust. He explained, and I quote, the Arabs have not agreed to a single solution that includes Jewish immigration, whether it be federal, national, or binational. Uh, Morris writes, 
uh, that the final nail in the coffin for binationalism was not the Holocaust, which actually hadn't yet occurred. It was the Arab re Revolt of 1936. This is before, of course, the Holocaust. Hitler was in power, but the Holocaust uh, had, not, had not begun. Uh, Arendt herself actually, and you, you quote Arendt, I know there are Rentians in the audience, including the person I live with. Um, although I'm much more critical of her than some others, Arendt herself admitted what she called, quote, the Arab refusal of any compromise. Yet she kept insisting, even in the midst of the 1948 war, on, quote, mixed Jewish, Arab, municipal, and rural councils. This was a fantasy. There were no such councils. And certainly in the midst of the war, there could never have been. It would be uh, it would be like telling the Bosnians in the middle of the war that they should they should form councils with with the Serbs. I should say, of course, there were a very 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 few Arab intellectuals. Sami Taha was one. There were there were a, a few who were willing. They were not by nationalists, but they were willing to meet uh, with with uh, the Zionists. Uh, they were all murdered by other Arabs. Uh, so th there was no tendency within the Arab national movement, the Palestinian national movement um, uh, uh, for binationalism. I think this has implications for, for what the, the present. Um, I wanted to say something else about the Peel Commission. Um, the Peel Commission, if, if, if you remember what it was actually responding to, the Peel Commission didn't say, oh, you know, partition is theoretically a great, a, a great idea. No, the Peel Commission laid out very clearly two things. A, there was increasing violence between the Arab and Jewish communities in, in a mandatory Palestine, even though the British had 100,000 troops there. B, that these two communities had, and again, the situation may be very different now, but had at that time had totally different communal arrangements, political arrangements, family arrangements, spoke different languages, had different religions, had different views towards the family, women. I mean, any, anything you can imagine. These were two completely disparate communities that were already in violence with each other. Uh, so that this was the reason for partition. It wasn't some sort of uh, just sort of ideological um, idea. Um, I just wanted to say you, you go into some of what happened in the war. And again, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding. I see this with my students about the 48 war, um, the, the, which of course starts with the Arab invasion, uh, May 16th. Azam Bey, who was the very well-respected, very learned uh, Egyptian diplomat, head of the Arab League, promised that the war would be, his quote, a war of extermination. So the, uh, the, the, this was seen as a zero-sum game by both sides. Um, the, the, uh, uh, one of the, the lead Palestinian uh, commanders, Al Husseini, said, it is inconceivable that Palestine will be for the Arabs and Zionists together. It is us for them. Uh, so the whole question of transfer, uh, et cetera, I think again, has to be seen in light of at least what the war actually was. Now, my point about the lack of binationalism in the Palestinian movement, it, I'm not making a moral or even political judgment on the Arab position. I think one could argue that it was totally understandable from, uh, from their point of view. And I'm not making any, any judgment right now on whether it was wise or unwise. My point though, is that I don't think you can see the development of the Jewish national movement, i.e. Zionism, apart from the development of the Arab national movement. The two are intertwined. They're still intertwined. They are unhappy but inseparable brothers. Uh, and so I believe you, you mentioned facts on the ground. Zionists were responding to the facts on the ground. They were responding as much to what was happening in Palestine as they were to what was happening in Europe, which by the way, many people, including in Palestine, didn't know a lot of what was happening in Europe, at least for, for quite a while. So, 
uh, what, what I'm raising, I um, mean, maybe you can respond to this. When you say that Zionists should, should make a kind of, I, don't, I know you don't mean a literal return, but a kind of intellectual return or, or a, a reimagining of a history or a tradition of binationalism. Again, I'm not sure how strong it was, but let's say it was. Palestinians have no such history to respond to, full stop. Binationalism has always been Jewish. Um, so I'm, I, I'm wondering what are the implications of this? Uh, and of course, I understand that the situation with Palestinians now, who of course are not a monolith, may be different than it was in 1936 or 1948. But I, I'm wondering if you can respond to, to the implications. The two movements have very, very different histories. Um, and while binationalism may be a salient part of, of Zionism, it is not a salient part of, of the Palestinian or the greater Arab national movement. Great. Um, Susie, this is it, or will you then speak more, or should I just respond? Or yeah, yeah please. Um, I want to um, um, partly agree about um, since you mentioned that there is no uh, what was it, no moral or historical judgment uh, involved in what I think you called um, um, the Arabs' uh, refusal to compromise. Um, Actually, I do uh, have a moral and political judgment, but I'm not making it right now. <laughs> that's right. I think. I think. I think it's important that um, it would be put on the table so that we can answer that. Um, right question. now, I'm, I'm simply saying that it is a fact. Yeah, I want. And I want I to say something about. The, I, I want to say something about this fact. I think that um, uh, this fact, um, as it is stated, uh, may be true, but I think it is indeed much more complicated than that because the reasons for the uh, the lack of a binational um, uh, tradition. Uh, has indeed good reasons, and for that reason, it cannot be pinned down to a certain Arab or Palestinian refusal to compromise uh, full stop. Um, one uh, perhaps good way to uh, tackle this, Susie, is to think about uh, uh, the partition resolution of the UN uh, in 47. Famously there too, uh, uh, we know how to, uh, to say, right? We all know it by heart. Um, the UN suggested a, a partition resolution. Uh, uh, the Jews accepted it. The Arabs refused to accept it. This is our, um, the way in which the Palestinians refuse, ideologically refuse. And um, um, for that reason, um, uh, we know that once they lost the war and lost the territory, uh, they are sort of, um, it's a self-imposed tragedy. Uh, uh, constellation. We all know to repeat that um, type of history, and I think this is um, completely false. I know I'm slightly digressing and changing the subject just a little. I'll return to the subject, to promise you. Um, I think it's a good example, though, of the, um, the way in which we speak about the Palestinians' uh, refusal, right? In 47, there were uh, 600,000 Palestinians. Uh, uh, um, sorry, there were 600,000 Jews in Palestine and a million uh, uh, 200,000 Palestinians. Uh, the Jews have arrived, uh, had arrived very recently. The Palestinians had been there for hundreds of years and um, a partition resolution suggests to split the territory, let's say half-half, more or less. Um, um, and we all know to say that the Jews accepted the deal and the Palestinians didn't and for that reason, they refused. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that um, I would have accepted that deal. I'm pretty sure that I would not have um, accepted the deal. I think that similar things can be said about the whole history um, of um, uh, binationalism. Why is it that Jews seek all sorts of constellations in Palestine, uh, partition, binationalism, and so forth? They are immigrants to the country and a minority in the country who seek to establish their own um, national self-determination in it. So they come up with political programs that will allow them to do that. And um, they need to do that. And the overriding majority thinks that it's uh, some chutzpah, frankly, to uh, think that you can come into the land and start having ideas about um, dividing it, whether by borders or by uh, rights. The Palestinians, uh, those who were thinking in national 
terms, had good reasons to reject um, um, such constellations. They did not have good reasons to think that they need to share uh, the land uh, with Jews. To that extent, I think that the uh, um, um, that we cannot reduce um, the Palestinian refusal to compromise to uh, some kind of an ideological um, opposition um, um, that cannot be overcome. I think that the facts on the ground have changed. They've changed in all sorts of ways. And for that reason, we can um, um, seek to revive a certain tradition that indeed has uh, um, uh, Jewish origins, uh, but can find uh, Arab uh, cooperation given the realities on the ground where this, the um, territory right now, I think sees about 50-50% uh, Palestinians and Jews. I wanna say um, another thing I want to connect to that you said, Susie, which I think is actually, we agree about, and I think is extremely important. Bi-nationalism requires Arab Jewish cooperation. It cannot be an idea that is uh, just of Jews or just of Arabs. And it can even not be, I think, an idea that will emerge from, um, say, Jewish parties collaborating with Arab parties. Binationalism requires a much nearer type of um, collaboration. Um, um, a demonstrated practice of the ability to live together uh, that we can build on, um, that we can somehow uh, use in order to draw on, in order to develop um, binationalist um, concepts. And I think that we're seeing at least a little of this type of um, practices. And those are the practices that I try to highlight in the book. Um, in order to, to then build on. So um, there is some tradition. 70 years after the establishment of the state, for example, um, uh, that's why uh, this book is called Haifa Republic. I claim that uh, we can see some of that, some of that in the city of Haifa. I don't want to do a Haifa romanticism. That would be completely false. I also say so in the book. I hope I'm not being misinterpreted by anybody about this. Uh, Haifa is not a utopia. Um, um, but you get a glimpse of, that you definitely do not get of uh, uh, cohabitation in Haifa, and by the way, in the Galilee also, I think, uh, uh, more to the north than just Haifa. Um, uh, you see something that you definitely do not see in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. Can we actually take those practices and make them political? Um, as you know, um, I was thrilled by uh, not the last elections, but the previous round of elections, when the Israeli liberal Zionist left completely collapsed. I think that was a good thing. I thought that was a good thing because that ghost has to die already. And um, um, many former liberal Zionists started to vote uh, to the joint list. That is um, um, the list of um, um, Arab parties, basically, right? People like my father, you know, uh, uh, a lifelong merits liberal Zionist, um, uh, um, an officer uh, in uh, reserve in the IDF, he voted uh, to the joint list for the first time in his life. There was a huge trend of, or a big trend of people going um, in that direction. And I thought that that was an example of the type of tradition um, that can be built on in order to, uh, um, that we need to build on in order to promote such a binational constellation that indeed can only draw on a certain joint tradition. I think that the joint list, I explained this in the book a little bit more, uh, the joint list I think is doing a very good job of um, showing that they are thinking in those terms. Um, they always are the best in showing solidarity um, uh, between Jews and Palestinians. Always when, for example, the Israeli Zionist center and the left attack ultra-Orthodox Jews. The Palestinians are always there um, to help them, um, um, to support them, to show solidarity with them. This is just one example um, of the type of um, genuine participation in a joint project that can, be, um, that can be used. Of course, in the chapter on the Holocaust, um, on the memory of the Holocaust, I finished that chapter 
with Ahmad Tibi's uh, Holocaust memorial speech. Ahmad Tibi is an important um, Palestinian Israeli member of Knesset. Um, he comes to the, um, uh, from the podium of the Knesset of parliament, he gives this really grand, I think, um, Holocaust memorial speech, making the point that he lives as a neighbor of Jews in that country. He knows that um, Jewish Holocaust survivors uh, came to this country and he's showing obvious, um, he's obviously happy that they're there, that they're flourishing, that they uh, managed to rebuild their lives, to have families in the country. Those are Arab representatives. Um, um, this is not just uh, um, something that they do and then pay the price of not getting reelected. I think that there are those traditions um, among the Palestinian society and um, we need to embrace them and to um, use them also with the Jewish tradition of Pai nationalism, something along those lines. Okay, so I'm just going to ask um, a couple of more things since I see that we're supposed to be uh, coming to questions. Uh, but I want to, we're probably not going to agree on history, but I, I want to pick up on something that, that you're saying about this question of binationalism. Um, and I'm wondering how you, what, what your analysis is of why your idea of the hyper republic, uh, where you are saying that national sovereignty uh, by Jews should be, self-determination should still exist, but not national sovereignty. I've never known any people, once they attain sovereignty, to give it up. Um, and I, I think that the, the history of the Jews um, calls that into question. But putting that aside, why or in, in what way do you see this as more politically feasible then let's say, uh, uh, you know, evacuating the settlements, which, you know, everyone says that's not politically feasible, probably true, but this is much more radical than that. So I, I, I'm curious as to your analysis as to how one gets from the idea to any sort of political feasibility. Um, yeah. First, um, about the feasibility of the two-state solution, and then um, uh, to the question of the feasibility of, uh, of my position. First, I, um, um, I'm glad that we now agree that probably you cannot evacuate enough settlers uh, in order to enable a two-state solution. Um, uh, but it's important for me, and I also say this in the book, that's not even the main issue, right? Um, we often treat this as a main issue, but this is again um, focusing on the Jewish side rather than uh, also seeing the Palestinian side. Between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea lives a Palestinian majority at the moment. And the idea, even if you evacuated the settlers, enough settlers, the idea of giving uh, this majority about 22% um, of the land I think is not the type of compromise um, that can bring peace. I think that uh, we sometimes say, this is in the tradition of calling out Palestinian refusal. Um, 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 we often say, you know, even when Olmark suggested uh, to Abbas everything, basically, they still refused. It. Well, I do not think that the Palestinian people can accept uh, the idea that they, as the majority on the territory, will receive about 22% of the land of, you know, discrete land, right? Part of it is in Gaza, part of it is in the West Bank. And that's even before we started speaking about uh, settlers. So the two-state solution is not feasible, period. And the type of geographical or geopolitical demographic uh, considerations that I mentioned showed why any solution needs to be one way or another um, um, in the form of a one state of uh, a federation or um, something along those lines, because you just do not have even a, continu a continuous Palestinian territory. So the issue is not the settlers. I think. Second, I'm still not with feasibility. It's I'm with desirability. That is why it was important for me uh, to start um, um, and to start the book by making what I take to be the crucial point. And I think we need to be clear about I do not believe that a Jewish state 
can be a democracy. Definitely not a liberal democracy, but not a democracy. And for that reason, I do not think that the two-state solution um, is a desirable one, given that the two-state solutions telos is to preserve the Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state and to um, um, uphold the um, Jewish democratic contradiction or illusion. I think that that's um, uh, not si something that's desirable. And I think that that's just not something that when we speak about reality is going to happen precisely because the Jewish state does not treat Arabs as equal. So it's not going to um, um, give them their rights or something along those lines. About um, uh, the feasibility of uh, one state politics. I think it's extremely far-fetched. I think that given the situation on the ground, it is more likely than a two-state solution, which I think is just um, um, simply is not possible, full stop. And since it's impossible and not desirable, I think that the only thing that we can do is promote the type of politics that we think is the right type of politics. Um, um, and that does not require, I don't know what, um, having the Palestinians refuse again to have, uh, to receive a, a, um, a state on 22% um, of the territory and then being called uh, um, refuseniks, right? Um, those who refuse to any compromise, even when they get everything, right? Um, I think that we just need to um, speak clearly about what would be the right constellation and to fight to establish it. I think that a lot of Palestinians um, uh, definitely who are Israeli citizens would have been uh, open to such a constellation. I think that with the right political activity, we can push in that direction. I think that some people on the left margins of merits and labor, I think this is complicated, could be uh, convinced to go down this path. Here's one example, my father, someone who was very, used to be very far from that. Um, he would support something along those lines today, and he's not the only one. Um, I think that some people on the right in Israel, don't forget, that's why the begging plan is uh, so useful uh, uh, for me. Um, some people on the right, uh, not many, who still think of themselves, say, as liberal, and think that um, um, democracy and um, human rights are important, could go um, along those lines. Some settlers who are liberal could maybe even accept um, such a plan. I think we have much more to work with uh, than with the long defunct two state solution. And that's, I think, what we need to um, mobilize. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing, and then I think you want us to start with questions. Okay, I'll, 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 I will just say um, that my reading of Jewish history is that being a minority did not work well for the Jews. Uh, and in my reading, at least, the idea of Israel or one idea of, of the establishment of Israel is that there would be one place in the world uh, where Jews were not a minority, where they did in fact have self-determination, which I, I see as very connected to sovereignty. And I think that you'll have, or and not you, but anyone would have a tremendous amount of trouble convincing most Israeli Jews that they should become a minority. And I, again, I don't think that there's anything in the long and bloody and terrible history of what Israelis and Palestinians have done to each other that would make Jew, Jewish Israelis uh, feel safe as a minority. And I should also say, just looking at the larger Middle East um, is not a kind place to minorities. Um, it is not good to be a Christian in Egypt. It is not good uh, to be a Yazidi in Syria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, in terms of feasibility, I know this is really complicated and we're not going to, to settle this at all, but I, I would just say that, that, that it's hard for me to see why the world will be a better place without one tiny place on earth where Jews do have sovereignty and self-determination. And of course, I believe that should include equal rights for everybody 
uh, within that sovereign nation. I, I know you think that's impossible, but it, it is just hard for me to see the world being uh, a, a vastly improved place or that most, you know, given the history that Israelis bring, whether the, you know from the Arab countries, from Europe or whatever, that they will be convinced um, of, of, a, of a productive and pacific future. Uh, although I certainly agree with you that the future doesn't look productive and pacific now either. I absolutely agree with you. Um, uh, absolutely, which is something that, you know, fills me with some despair. Thank you. Um, can I respond to this uh, briefly? I want yes, to um, I wanna say, I'll say this fast. Um, um, first, um, the notion of Jews being a minority, uh, a minority that um, it's not, it will not be good for them to be a minority. That's not a feature that is specific to my constellation. I think it's extremely important that we say it clearly and out loud, Susie. The Jews are the minority between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. So the question is not whether um, um, they will be the minority, um, but what we do about the fact that they are and how we go about politics or indeed war. Given this fact, this is why, this is something that hasn't been mentioned a lot in this conversation, why I think that um, the politics of the Nakba, the uh, history of it and also the future of it um, is um, uh, um, um, haunting this book. Uh, because I agree, it's not, um, it's not easy to tell Jews you, you'll be the minority, but they are the minority. So the question is whether because it's not so safe to be the minority, doing what we're doing now is the right constellation. Um, given that the two-state solution, in my view at least, and I'm willing to argue about this for a long time, I will not do it here, is not an option. How do we go about this politically? Do we go about this by pretending that there will be a two-state solution and continuing to do the really apartheid that um, um, we're preserving there? Are we going to um, uh, continue rehabilitating the politics of transfer, which I think is being rehabilitated at the heart of Israeli uh, uh, politics. How do we go about that? That's one thing. Second, you you were right, and we will not solve this here. Um, um, you're right. See, I, I understand the desire and the need um, for a state where the Jews are the majority and the sovereign. They're not the majority. The sovereign, um, the Jews as a sovereign, that will not give you a democratic country. And I think that that is a concern, a big one um, for people who live in this uh, country. And I think for that reason, we need um, to think further, but it's true that this, we will not, um, we will not solve here. Yeah. Well, it's been really fascinating to hear you two both articulate not only your, your points of difference, but also your common ground. Um, it's, if I could just say, I urge every, despite my disagreements, I urge everyone to read Omri's book. <laughs> I buy it and read it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, now we have some questions in the in the Q and A. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we have some questions in the Q and A. Uh, Selah Ben Habib asks, um, maybe we can just very quickly lay down some definitions. I don't understand the distinction between Jewish self determination and Jewish sovereignty. I think that might help everyone um, to to clarify that. Okay, well, Shayla, I don't either. Uh, I think that they're intertwined. I think the history of the 20th century, all the anti-colonial movements, show that they're intertwined. This is something I actually asked Omri. Uh, th th this afternoon. So le let Omri explain. And I, I encourage Susie to ask the question. I'm glad that Sheila, uh, who used to be my teacher, um, um, and of course understands so much more uh, than most of us um, about those issues. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that Sheila is raising this. Um, I do not think that they need to be uh, necessarily exclusive uh, um, notions. They can also be on a certain um, spectrum. This is also what I told Susie in our earlier conversation uh, this morning. I think that, um, for example, the ability to determine one's culture, one's uh, language, one's own laws um, um, is um, a set of uh, rights, a set of powers that are normally associated more with um, self-determination where, say, the right to declare war, uh, decisions on borders, on international treaties would be um, powers more associated um, with sovereignty. I think that the Catalans uh, in Spain have uh, self-determination, but not sovereignty. 
um, uh, sovereign um, are, um, is uh, uh, Spain. That's one obvious um, um, example. Um, in the constellation that I'm uh, suggesting, I think that uh, two call them autonomies that have self-determination in the sense that they can decide on education, on uh, uh, language and so forth and so forth. But um, 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 there's, uh, let's call this even a form of sovereignty, right? On a certain spectrum of levels of sovereignty, this sovereign sovereignty will be uh, checked, uh, say by a joint constitution that will forbid that, um, that any of those autonomies will legislate laws that can contradict the full um, um, individual and national rights of everybody on the whole territory. So we have here a certain grade um, um, of um, sovereignty that's diminished. By the way, since I actually agree with the question, if I understand uh, what the question is implying, since I think that I actually agree with it, you will find that the book is deliberately actually a little bit ambiguous about it. It sometimes speaks about uh, self-determination. Sometimes it says um, those two entities would actually have sovereignty, but to a diminished degree, their sovereignty will be checked by a joint constitution and so forth and so forth. So um, um, that's a notion that I'm after. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is clarifying. Um, thanks for addressing that. Another question comes from Vince Punzo. Uh, they were particularly struck by the paradoxical and they imagine controversial notion of remembering to forget both the Holocaust and the Nakba. Um, could one still capture the essence of your vision, they ask, by uh, employing a phrase such as national, quote, reconstructing or reimagining memories of these events? Yes, without the word uh, national. The idea is that I think that memory has been uh, used and abused in order to define the borders of nationalism, right? Um, in Israel, for sure. And um, the idea is that I try to promote with the notion of forgetting, or um, I can't remember what it was, restructuring, reimagining, which I'm perfectly happy with, um, uh, would have to be open in a way that makes it not national. So I, as let's say a partly German Jew, who is Israeli also, um, can remember the Holocaust as a citizen in Israel with Ahmad Tibi and with my neighbors in the Galilee. And let me tell you, this is not as far-fetched as one might think. The point is to insist that this can actually be done. And I can also commemorate the Holocaust privately um, in other ways. Uh, um, if I want to go, I, I don't. But if I want to go on those uh, uh, visits to Auschwitz, say, uh, I will be able to do that. But as a state practice, memory will have to be a public um, uh, duty of citizens, um, like Ahmed Tibi uh, um, uh, demonstrates in his um, speech. And by the way, like Mansour Abbas, uh, who's now sitting in the government, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, very disappointed with his politics now. I used to be a bigger fan. I'm now disillusioned and disappointed. Let me put my cards on the table. But he gave also a very impressive Holocaust memorial speech much before entry as uh, a coalition. Um, those practices are possible and I think desirable. Um, um, I, um, we can call them reimagining or restructuring. Um, they include, and this is extremely important to say, especially today, I think that they include an act of forgetting. And they include an act of forgetting because we Israelis remember, and we remember in a certain way. We remember from a certain standpoint, and we will have to overcome that standpoint. Aka forget, in order to achieve um, uh, this transition. Uh, to connect this more concretely to politics, just imagine that uh, uh, Danny Dayan was just elected to be the chair uh, uh, of Yad Vashem, right? So the head. The CEO of the settlers movement uh, is your next um, uh, uh, CEO, if you'd like, of uh, Yad Vashem. Um, I think this is, uh, for Jews who care about memory, this is um, frankly horrifying. Um, I would remember the Holocaust as an Israeli with Ahmad Tibi and Ayman Ode more than with uh, uh, Danny Dayan. Yeah, I think this is really a, a really important and very beautiful part of Omri's book. 
uh, the whole question of what one does with trauma. Um, uh, I hate the, you know, it, and he's not putting forth some superficial, you know, moving on or, or sort of psycho babble uh, that sometimes is used, but what, what does one do with, what does a people do with their trauma? And I think that that's also really an issue now in the US, you know, there's a lot of revisiting of, you know, the history of slavery, of, uh, you know, African American oppression, uh, uh, but, you know, I think the question is, what do you do with, with, with the trauma um, and with the pain of your history? Uh, and it can be in, you know, for any people, uh, Palestinians with the Nakba, Jews with the Holocaust, whomever, you know, it can be a way of, of in a way of being frozen um, or it can be used as a way uh, uh, for the future. Omri has a, a nice uh, line or a couple of lines, I'm paraphrasing now, but how the prophets always were looking to the future. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how do you use your history? And I, I think this is actually, will probably be a controversial uh, part of Omri's book, but I think it's really a very beautiful um, uh, and deep uh, part of the book. Thank you. Um, so we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I should also issue a correction. It seems that uh, Joel White Book's questions have been showing up as Shayla Ben Habib. So earlier Shayla's question was in fact Joel's. Um, but we do have sort of a couple questions that are, are talking about the idea of safety. Um, one from an anonymous attendee begins with some generalizations that I won't repeat, um, but that goes on to say, do you believe that Jews would be safe as a minority in an Arab majority state? And do you believe that such a state would be a liberal democracy? Um, and then there's another question that simply asks, this is Gordon Bloomberg, why is a Jewish state needed? So maybe these two are similar questions, maybe they're unrelated, but I think they might be. Whether Jews will be sa would be safe in, um, um, in an Arab majority uh, uh, state, I say again and again, I think it's an important distinction for our conversation. It is an Arab majority or a Palestinian majority state, but it's true that the Jews control it. And this is extremely important to remember when we're trying to configure uh, political solutions. There is a way, um, among other things, because the Jews control the situation, because the Jews are the sovereign, uh, um, not to go uh, too cliche and too simplistic with this, but that um, um, they also get um, to tell the story. They also get, for example, to count. And for that reason, they count in ways, uh, um, are called in English uh, gerrymandering. They're called, they're, they count in ways that uh, pretend that they are not um, uh, the minority. But we Jews are the minority in the territories that we control. Even if we disregard Gaza, uh, we are almost on 50-50. So um, the situation is um, already a Jewish minority. Is it safe? So let us formulate the question in this way. Is it safe for Jews um, to live in a democracy um, where they're not the majority? And the answer is that it's very, very complicated. And I don't think that the answer to that question can be, answered, can be given lightly. It ought not be given lightly. But once um, the question is formulated properly, and I think um, I reformulated in the way that I think is the proper formulation of the question, I think we need to understand the pressures on answering it by producing the type of politics that would make it safe. Um, it's not going to happen just tomorrow, obviously. What, are the, what is the political transition that would make it safe uh, for Jews and Palestinians? Because it's extremely important to say it's not safe for Palestinians, um, uh, even though they are the majority. It's extremely unsafe for Palestinians uh, to be controlled by Jews. By the way, I do not think that it is any more safe for Palestinians nowadays to be controlled by Jews than what it would be for Jews to be controlled by Palestinians. I think the images, uh, the uncivilized image is actually pretty similar probably. Uh, probably. The situation is awful. And um, uh, by no means I uh, would like to imagine that the Jews would suffer 
in a one state solution what the Palestinians now suffer. But since that's a situation, we need to think of ways in order to make such transitions safe. Um, there's not gonna be a two state solution, not tomorrow and not at all. There's also not going to be a one state solution tomorrow. I think it's an excellent question when we produce and promote one state politics, what are um, the ways to keep it safe? Thank you for that. That's a a really thoughtful answer. And I think you're absolutely right that we need to consider the safety of Palestinians as well. Um, I think we're just about out of time, but do either of you have any final thoughts before we, we sign off for the evening? Aubrey. Um, maybe one thought that I had, I know that that meeting was now delayed. I thought that one issue of timing, our timing was perfect in some ways, in some ways, because just today Biden uh, and uh, Naftali Bennett were supposed to meet at the White House. I know that this was delayed uh, for tomorrow. I think that one thing that um, this book was trying to do is to say, look, you cannot back paddle to um, two state lies, let alone to two state politics. So uh, I think that I, I don't really fool myself that this is going to happen anytime soon, but I think that um, on the eve of a meeting between um, an Israeli prime minister who is actually a C, the, also the, the former CEO of the settlers movement. And let me tell you, is not a pragmatist, even though people will try to sell, to, um, uh, to sell him uh, as a pragmatist, a liberal um, um, white guy, let me even call him. Um, I think it's extremely important that we remember that um, um, the task of American Democrats is to start pushing to an alternative solution in Israel um, and Palestine. We cannot just pretend that the situation can be contained. We cannot just pretend that um, uh, things will stay the way that they are. One obvious fact that uh, uh, um, was very vivid uh, um, just a few months ago was again successfully repressed. And this is what we witnessed in uh, the last May. Uh, um, that was just, I think, uh, um, what the Germans would call a, a Vorgeschmack, just a, a teaser of uh, the type of violence that we're about to see within Israel and Palestine uh, if um, no alternative politics will be produced. Um, um, and I think we must, uh, yeah, that's, that, that would be my comment. Yes, Thank my, you for that. My, my only final comment, um, and I'm addressing this to Amri, is that Amri, I hope your book is published in Hebrew and Arabic. I know, of course, a lot of Israelis and many, although fewer Palestinians read English, but I, I, I would like the book to be published in those two languages because it's really the reaction to the book there that's much more important than what it is um, here in Brooklyn. Absolutely. And we can hope that, you know, that meeting between Biden and Bennett was delayed to give Biden enough time to, to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Omri, Susie, thank you both so much for joining us. This is a very thoughtful and provocative conversation. Um, thanks to our audience for your very engaging questions. I wish we could get to all of them, but we'd be up all night. Um, those of you at home, please do consider purchasing a copy of Haifa Republic from Community Bookstore, and we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening, everyone. Take care. <laughs>